All he said to me was, just go and run 230 and nothing else. Don't try to do any, you know, n nothing magical, nothing that you haven't trained for. Just go and run the race that you know you're in shape for. This is Running For Real, the podcast for runners who know that for every runner's high, there are just as many lows. All those just missed PRs, easy runs that feel hard, injury blues, and more. Each week, we'll talk to running, health, and wellness experts about their highs, lows, and best advice to build our confidence. Running For Real is about being honest, being brave, and most of all, not feeling alone. And now here's our host, who used to spend her summer in Devon with her grandma and her sister Jess, Tina Muir. Hello, my friends. Thank you so much for joining me for episode 16 of the Running For Real podcast. I am really excited that you are here right now. And, uh, you know, I have a great episode for you coming this week. Uh, someone that I'm really excited I was able to get an interview so quick because uh, she only just ran Western States just a few weeks ago and uh, had a great race. Really been such an inspiration to me for many years. So I'm very excited to have Magda Boulay on the podcast. But first, just in case you missed it, Last week on the podcast, I made a rather important announcement and had Tawny Prazak on, or sorry, I should say Tawny Gibson on the podcast to talk with me about us both being pregnant. So if you did miss that one, I hope you will go back and check it out and maybe read my blog post about kind of announcing how this happened. I am just still a bit shocked about it, but very excited and uh, yeah, it's, it, hopefully you will enjoy that episode if you did miss it. So today, yeah, I'm talking to Magda Boulay, who finished second at Western States just a few weeks ago. She is also an Olympian and has had success in all distances, really, but has now kind of found her home in ultra running and has just become, you know, a powerhouse despite being one of the older ultra runners at the top of the seen but she's doing so well and I think you're gonna absolutely love her she is such a sweetheart and I'm really looking forward to hearing what you think about it so after a minute to thank our sponsor we will be right to the interview Technology has come a long way and later in the show you're going to get to meet one of the best advances for running I've ever seen and you're going to love her. If you have to train on your own a lot like I did V will be just what you need. Check out getvi.com for more information. Magda, I am so excited to have you on the Running For Real podcast. Welcome and thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you for having me on the show. It is. It's, this is going to be an interesting one and I know people are very interested to kind of hear about your story from Western States as it was such a brutal one. But I kind of want to go back a little bit more first, go towards your earlier years of running as this isn't kind of you popping up out of nowhere. You've been around for quite a while and in various different things. So I kind of want to go back to that. So maybe we can begin by, you know, you, you grew up in Poland. Uh, maybe you could tell us how it's different running in Poland because, you know, being from England, people always ask me, what it's like running in England versus America. So maybe you could say the difference between <laughs> Poland and America, if you even ran when you were in Poland. Great question. No, I spent a lot of time in a swimming pool mm -hmm. growing up. Uh, my dad was a swimmer and uh, I, you know, I bounced around uh, between swimming pool, uh, pools and lakes. So mm -hmm. I was not a runner in Poland. Uh, so running uh, was born for me here in the United States. And I've had the opportunity to go and race in Poland a couple of times in my running career. But mm -hmm. uh, growing up, I spent a lot of time in a swimming pool. Mm -hmm. So you said that you kind of picked it up when you got here. Was it pretty soon after you got here or was it something that you kind of picked up naturally or was it something you noticed immediately yeah. when you got here? Yeah, so I think it was more social. You know, when you move to a different country, you for opportunities to meet friends. And I met a friend who was, uh, who was on a team. Uh, I was a senior in high school. And I remember, you know, I was convinced to come to practice mm -hmm. during cross-country season. And uh, I fell in love with just the feeling, you know, of like going on a run and just kind of the, you know, the free spirit uh, of running that I got out of it versus, you know, just getting in a pool for, you know, for an hour and, you know, looking at the bottom of the pool. Yeah. I still love swimming, but uh, running just opened my eyes to, you know, to just like having so much fun and just exploring, you know, different 
neighborhoods and you can talk to people while, while you're running. So I was sold the first day and never looked back. Mm-hmm. And you said you still enjoy swimming. Do you, do you still do it as part of your training or is it just kind of a leisurely thing you might do from time to time? It's more from time to time, you know, usually as a runner, you know, I try to do a little bit of cross training Mm -hmm. here and there and uh, I feel very comfortable in a pool. Mm -hmm. So that is my kind of go to if I if I need to give my body rest from from the pounding, I jump in the pool and I feel very fortunate because I can always get a you know good workout if I need to. Uh, just because of my swimming background. Yeah. And I'm just curious because I actually started out as a swimmer as well. And I'm convinced that's a huge part of the reason I was initially successful at running because of, you know, the big lungs you develop. So how much do you think uh, swimming did play a part in, you know, you having some success in running and kind of maybe even now all those hours you spent in the pool kind of pointed towards the long distance stuff with what you were able to do? Great question. I think that uh, more than anything, obviously, specificity is uh, is not quite there mm-hmm. in terms of you know in terms of your, how you move your body. Mm-hmm. But like you said, you know, aerobically, swimming is a great complement to running. But more than anything, I feel like swimmers, you know, just the, the mental toughness of just you yes. know being hours and hours in the pool. Uh, that they spend and, you know, just doing something that, you know, kind of, it's kind of boring, right? Mm-hmm. I, you're just you know, doing one lap after another. And with distance running, I mean, it's kind of, you, you kind of have to learn how to embrace that. And I think I took that away where, you know, I was able to just embrace going for miles and miles. Mm-hmm. And were there any other signs even back then when you started running that you were going to be kind of into the really long distance? I mean, I'm guessing... You didn't even really know about ultra marathoning, but obviously marathoning was probably pretty in the forefront of your mind to some degree. Did you have like an indicator early on that you were going to enjoy the longer stuff rather than the short stuff? Yeah, I I had no idea. And actually, you know, just uh, I went to college uh, and ran my longest distance in college was uh, 5,000 meters. Mm-hmm. And I always, you know, even to this day, I wonder, you know, how I would have done in a tanky in college. You know, mm. How come I didn't try that? Because I think ultimately that was probably an event that would have been bested. But, you know, I think that I just had such a natural progression. And because I started running kind of late, you know, I really enjoy the shorter distances, the middle distances in college. And it wasn't until after college that, you know, I started to really, you know, question um, if I was in the right distance. And just for some reason, just my lifestyle kind of led me to, to marathons. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I spent uh, a decade or over a decade training for marathons. And uh, my beginning was mostly just, you know, I uh, when you graduate from college, you have uh, you have to make a decision. You know, at what level do you want running to be in your life? And I knew that I wanted to, you know, to try to be, you know, the best runner that I could, which required getting creative with a, with your job or a couple of jobs mm-hmm. that could fit around uh, your training. And at that time, you know, I realized that it was really convenient for me to just get up in the morning and run, you know, 10 miles in the morning yeah. on roads or trails. And that was a perfect training for a marathon versus trying to do track workouts at high intensity at six o'clock in the morning. So naturally it was just my lifestyle that kind of directed me in the, in a path uh, uh, to do marathons. Mm -hmm. And once I started, it was, uh, it it just, I quickly realized that I was in the right place, that Mm -hmm. it was, this is where I was meant to be. Mm -hmm. And what was your debut marathon? Just for you. I went to do a Cleveland marathon. Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, I guess firstly, why Cleveland? (laughs) You know, I was looking, I got, I was looking for, for a race in the spring that was not a big time, you know, Mm. world major where, uh, I would just get lost. I wanted to, to be in a race that was, you know, uh, good competition for me that I could be, you know, up front. Uh, at that time, you know, I really, really wanted to run, you know, in two forties. I think yep. uh, my goal was to to break two forty five or between two forty two forty five. And I felt, you know, there are not that many races, you know, that are good courses in the United States. Uh, sometime around, you know, April May, 
And that was one of them. And I remember reaching out to the race director and they offered me travel money for me to get to Cleveland. And I said, this is a great opportunity. I'm on it. I'm going to go and, and run Cleveland Marathon. Mm-hmm. And so what, what was the exact time you ended up running? 244 and change. Okay. So you, you got under that 245 that you wanted to. And uh, so right. from there, you kind of continued to improve in the marathon until you did qualify for the Olympics in 2008. But unfortunately, you know, right. you, you had a rough time with your knee and had to drop out. So maybe you could kind of tell us, right. you know, how, how, well, firstly, how did that feel qualifying for the Olympics, knowing that that's like the ultimate dream of like every runner out there. So how did it feel knowing that, you know, you were one of the the lucky few who got to, you know, be an Olympian? Right. I mean, it's, if you really think about it, my Cleveland Marathon debut was in 2000, 2001. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it was in 2000. So 2008, when I made the team was, uh, that was eight years later. And uh, it was, it was a long, long process of uh, training uh, and dedicating time to, you know, to becoming the best marathoner I could be. And honestly, it, this would have never happened if I never met my coach, Jack Daniels. Yes. I think that I, you know, right after Cleveland, you know, I had the opportunity to to meet uh, coach Jack Daniels. And since 2001, uh, he was, you know, he was the only coach I worked with. And every year I just got a little bit better. Mm-hmm. Every year we did a little bit more. Every year we took my training to the next level. And in 2004, actually, at the Olympic trials, I came a little short. I finished fifth and was uh, devastated that it didn't mm-hmm. work out, but it was the best uh, learning lesson for me at that time. And made a decision to, to go and have family. So my son was born in 2005. And I was convinced that, you know, I was going to hold the line in 2008 and, you know, give it, uh, give it one more try. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I was running with a brand new inspiration after my son was born Mm -hmm. and a completely different, you know, level of motivation. Yeah. And it was an incredible race for me. It was a day that we all dream about, you know, having as, uh, as competitors, like everything just lined up. I, uh, I remember having coffee the morning before the race with my coach and he goes, uh, he calls me Chewy. He goes, Chewy, what are you going to do today? I said, I'm going to go and run my race. And he says, what are you in shape? What have you been, uh, what are you in shape for? I said, I'm in shape to run 230. And looking at the history of Olympic trials, you know, before that, that would have put me on a podium if I ran 230. Mm -hmm. And all he said to me, he goes, just go and run 230 and nothing else. Don't try to do any, you know, n- nothing magical, nothing that you haven't trained for. Just go and run the race that you know you're in shape for. Mm. And that was just the best advice that I could have received because the gun went off and I started running 545 and no one, no one decided to run with me. Everyone, you know, was, uh, was running a very tactical race. And I just kept clicking off 545s all the way to the end and ran 230. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's, that's really the way to do it. You know, I've always, it's funny you say that because that's pretty much exactly how I race every time. But I, I have heard people kind of, I guess, criticize that method, kind of saying like, yeah, but you're not racing. That's the whole point of being in a, a trial is that you race. And I'm kind of like, well, you know what, if I'm doing my best, then that's, you know, that's yeah. all I can ask for. And that's my best way yeah. to race rather than, yeah, like playing games and doing fart legs essentially in the race. Right. So, so yeah, I love that you did it that way. And, you know, yeah, I bet an incredible feeling. And that adds a whole new level of inspiration to me, knowing that you did that at the same time that I uh, am actually pregnant right now. And it's kind of the same amount of time oh. away from, um, <laughs> Congratulations. away from the Olympics. Thank you. So, um, it's good to hear that you were able to make it back for the Olympics. So if I, if I want to go that route, I can, uh, you know, go for it and see what I can do. But um, this is about you. So we'll go back to you. But um, so you got to the Olympics, you had a knee issue and you had to drop out. But before you did have yeah. to drop out, did, 
Were you able to enjoy the Olympic experience or, were you, or was it kind of tainted by the frustration and like fear of how bad your knee was? Yeah, it, you know, I, um, it's a very good question. I don't think anyone has asked me that. And it was exactly that. I was extremely frustrated. I, I feel to this day that there was just so much um, pressure that I put on myself mm-hmm. to perform a certain way. You know, I, when you when you put so much time in, you want to represent your country to, mm-hmm. you know, to your best ability and, and having, you know, having uh, that injury, you know, happened the week uh, before the race was extremely, extremely frustrated. And, you know, you, you feel that sense of guilt and, you know, that, you, you know, there are only three women representing the country and you, you know, you have a bummed me. So I, I definitely, I definitely didn't enjoy it as if I, probably were in a different situation and mm-hmm. I still, you know, very based. I think about it, you know, how, uh, you know, maybe, you know, if, um, yeah, may, I probably would have had a much, uh, much better experience uh, and I would have, you know, appreciated uh, the whole, you know, atmosphere of yeah. uh, being an Olympian and, and, and getting there and really enjoying everybody, everybody else around me. Mm-hmm. But I was just so caught up in, you know, in a very unfortunate situation that uh, it took a lot of fun out of it. Yeah, I can imagine. And that's kind of why I asked that, because I can, I can only imagine, you know, how that would feel and how, you know, when we have injuries, it tends to plague our mind all day long. And especially in a situation like that, we know everyone's right. watching you and things like that. And um, right. so if you, if you went to the Olympics, like, you know, this year, right now, do you think you would have been able to enjoy it more or do you think you still, and had that same injury, do you think oh. now you would have been able to just <laughs> <Yes>. say whatever? <laughs> I think, right. I think that, uh, uh, I would have, cause I know better now, you know, mm-hmm. I know that there's the things that you can control and certain things that you can. And I'm a little bit, uh, taking myself out of that situation and just looking, you know, from, from far away, you know, I would have given myself uh, very different advice mm-hmm. and, it is unfortunate when we get hurt and sometimes, you know, the worst time to get hurt is when you're trying to represent your country and yes. trying to, you know, to, to run the most important race of your life. Mm-hmm. But at the end, you know, if you really think what the spirit of Olympics is and, and for me, for someone who, you know, just a few years ago, just ran 245 marathon and uh, it was a huge, huge accomplishment mm-hmm. uh, already. And I should, you should have given I think myself a little bit, uh, a little bit more permission to, to enjoy uh, yeah. just being there. No, that makes total sense. And then when it came to actually doing it, you know, how, how did that feel? Was it, I mean, I'm guessing it was really hard to accept when you finally reached that point where you had to step off the course. Yeah. Oh, it was devastating. I think that, you know, it took me you know, months after, mm-hmm. you know, um, after the Olympics to actually make, make peace with it. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, I, I think, you know, whether it's Olympics or any, you know, any other race, but especially Olympics, like dropping out out of a race is extremely difficult to, mm-hmm. to deal for me. And it's it's never easy to repair that uh, that damage that, you know, that has happened. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, I've always I've always had, you know, a reason to uh, to drop out um, and that you know, most of the time, you know, was, you know, beyond my control, it's either being injured or, or sick, but it's never easy. No. Even when you do have, you know, a reason that, okay, this was probably better for my health to stop. I'm not doing any good to myself by keep going, but still it never, ever feels easy. No, no, you're exactly right. And um, I think it's good for people listening to hear you say that, knowing that, you know, even at your level, even, you know, people see you as this you know, superhero and hearing you say that, I think that really is great for us to hear knowing that everyone goes through it, obviously not great for you to go through it, but, um, thank you for being honest and sharing that with us. And so you had, you know, a lot of success after that, um, went on to run a 226 marathon successful in a lot of the races that you did, um, won a few races, um, and then, you know, your debut, uh, in the ultra marathon world went down pretty well, winning, winning Western States. But what what were you doing in between 2010 and 2015? Was there, you know, the tell us maybe a bit about the kind of transition of when you decided that it was time to kind of head towards the ultra world. 
Right. So I, I did uh, I did uh, prepare myself for one more Olympic trials in 2012, and I uh, got in the top 10, so I didn't make the team. But, you know, that was now about, you know, about 10, 12 years of marathoning. And, um, and I was, I was ready to try something different. Mm -hmm. I was um, was ready for a new challenge. I was ready for a different direction and and motivation. And uh, most, you know, most uh, athletes, you know, that have competed with, with me around the same time or earlier, once they reach that point, they kind of just leave the sport. Once they know that, uh, you know, oh, you know, I, this is, kind of my last Olympic trials and they kind of just walk away. And I, I wasn't ready to walk away from, from running or from, from competing. I just, I was ready to walk away from road marathons. Mm-hmm. So in 2013, I made myself a promise or a challenge. I said this year I want, I was training actually 40 <laughs> that year. Mm-hmm. So this was a good year to kind of commit mm-hmm. yourself to something. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I came up, with a challenge that uh, I was going to run one mile master's championships on the road in August and follow that with a 50 mile trail run. Yeah. They were completely opposite. Yeah. And so far, you know, from, you know, from like how you train for both of them, but that was a challenge that was exciting to me. Mm-hmm. That was, it was challenging in a way. And, you know, I said, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go and explore. So I did, um, Win the Masters Championship in a mile. I think it was in Pittsburgh, and um, and then I switched gears and started training for a, you know for a fifty miler. And I've always enjoyed like one of the workouts for marathons. Favorite workouts was always the long run. Mm-hmm. So I knew like deep inside that you know there was something about this long stuff that I was going to enjoy. Yeah. And yeah, that year I ran my first fifty miler. Uh, which was uh, at the North Face Championship race in San Francisco in December. And I finished second. And again, that was the first step towards uh, what I consider an amazing, amazing uh, ultra running career right now. Just I'm having so much fun with it. Yeah. And you you are definitely doing well with it. And so you you did turn to, you know, ultra running and as you mentioned there, you just kind of went up in distance and, and we will talk about Western States and just the longest up in a minute, but do you prefer one or the other, maybe ultra or marathons, like looking back or is it, is it kind of, they're too difficult to kind of, they're so different. I'm just curious if you could do one, only one in your life, which one do you think you would have chosen? Well, that's, that is a very difficult question (laughs) because if you told me that ultra running was in the Olympics, I would have said I'm going to be an ultra mm. runner and I'm going to go for the Olympic because that is the ultimate, right? That yeah. like growing up and watching Olympics and, you know, I mean, I watched all the sports and I, yeah. there were times where I wanted to be in the Olympics for swimming and then gymnastics. And, mm-hmm. and then it was, you know, speed skating. And, uh, I never really thought about me actually making the Olympic team and running, but you know, it, it is something that it's it's just this incredible, you know, level of talent that goes through and work. And it's just such a fine balance of, you know, what all these uh, athletes do when they get to that level. And yeah, it's it's a dream for, mm-hmm. you know, once you get into athletics and once you get to college, you're just so much closer to that world and you start really appreciating, you know, what is happening at, you know, at that athletic level at the Olympics. And yeah, so if ultra running uh, were in the Olympics, I would definitely do it. <laughs> oh, so you've definitely found your calling now. Maybe it'll end up there eventually. We can we can only hope. Um, yeah, you, you know, obviously you've you've been having a lot of success, and uh, we're going to talk about Western States uh, 2017 in just a minute. But um, you know, you mentioned earlier about the marathon and how you just kind of um, working with Jack. You just said, you know what, I'm going to stick to my own race plan. I'm going to listen to my body and what it tells me. Is that even more important in ultra running or is that less important in ultra running? I think it's uh, extremely, extremely important ultra running. I think it's extremely important in, uh, uh, when you race mm-hmm. because the, there is just so much more room for mistakes. Yeah. And um, I think that the shorter the race, the more risk you can take. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and you, you might get away with... Uh, 
you know, burning matches here and there. But in in a in a hundred mile race, you know, once you burn it, it's difficult to to repair that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, I I did watch your interview with I Run Far after Western States this year, which and I'll put a link in the show notes for anyone, which you can find at tinamuir dot com forward slash episode sixteen. But you know, you kind of talked about how um, there was you know, a group of girls at one point and you could have gone with them and part of you thought about it, but you knew for you, it wasn't the right time to do it. So maybe you just could just kind of talk about that for anyone who's thinking about maybe an ultra race, because I know in a lot of um, marathons and half marathons and thing, people run with paces and they think, oh, you know, I'm going to stick with a group because if I stick with a group, then they'll pull me on. But maybe an ultra running, that's not necessarily yeah. the best idea. Right. I think that uh, especially in early, you know, early miles, it's really important to listen to listen to your body. You know, Western States is a very, very unique course. It has a lot of different elements from, you know, just your altitude. It has, uh, you know, it has a lot of vertical and it also has, you know, just challenging heat. And I have now completed uh, three 100 mile races and I just keep learning that, you know, some of the kind of low moments that you have where your body is just not, it's not floating, you know, on, uh, uh, on, you know, cloud nine, you're not mm-hmm. feeling great all the time and that you do have to respect the moments where you just, you know, don't feel a hundred percent and you need to listen to, you know, to your body, uh, your body's cues and, and the signs that it's giving you. And it's so worth backing off when your body is telling you, because the race is so long that, if it's truly like if you have more in a tank, it will be there at the end. Mm-hmm. And if you push through some of the signs early in the race, it's going to be very difficult to to have a strong finish. Mm-hmm. No, that makes that makes total sense. And I think that's really important for people to hear because I know a lot of our listeners are considering, you know, maybe trying an ultra or maybe they're like dipping their toes in the water with a 50k. And I think that's good to hear that this isn't kind of like, you know, marathoning or shorter distances where you can kind of brute force your way through the tough parts because if you do that it's gonna gonna really come back and bite you and do you have any other advice for someone who's thinking about kind of stepping up and moving to the longer distances well my my biggest probably um uh takeaway when i made the transition was learning how to power hike with purpose Mm -hmm. and incorporating that strategically into your into your racing I remember, you know, when, you know, when someone uh, first told me that I should uh, hike this hill instead of run it, I said, but I can run it. Like, why would I, uh, why why would I hike it? Because it's not as efficient. And really, uh, ultra running is about, you know, managing that energy level. It's managing the stress, managing the heat. And uh, you, you can do a lot of good by, you know, evaluating certain steep hills. And lowering your heart rate a little bit, using that uh, steep hill, how to hike it, and maybe use it to your advantage mm. by feeling on it because your heart rate is a little bit lower. So there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of, you have to do it with confidence versus feeling this sense of guilt and maybe shame that you no longer, you know, are able to run this this hill. Maybe you're not as fit. So it's it's really a fine balance of uh, of appreciating what the the course is throwing at you, but also being confident uh, in uh, in using those those tools that are uh, you know like power hiking to your advantage. Mm-hmm. No, that's great advice. Thank you very much for that. And then you you know Jack is has been your coach for a long time, as you mentioned earlier. Does is does he stay involved with the ultra running? Like how? Because I'm guessing. You are one of the first people he's mm-hmm. worked with who is an ultra runner, right? So maybe right. how has he kind of transitioned with uh, learning about it and kind of, you know, using his incredible brain to kind of come to your advantage, I guess? Yeah. So uh, Jack doesn't coach me for oh. ultras. Uh, we always, uh, we, we chat about this a lot. And you know, it's it's funny that, that you mentioned because uh, he's actually visiting me right now. Um, mm-hmm. and, uh, he's giving, he, he's giving a talk at my work, which is, uh, yeah, uh, incredible, but, um, no, uh, I'm being coached by Ian Sherman. Okay. And, uh, Ian and I, you know, always talk about training and what I like to do. And a lot of the workouts I have done with Jack, I like to keep him in, mm-hmm. in my routine. 
but there's a lot that I, I still need to learn, you know, as, uh, as an ultra runner. And some of, you know, the perfect example is, you know, Ian is an incredible power hiker. If you ever watch this guy, like I have, when I run with him, I have to run next to him in order to even, you know, uh, maintain his hiking pace. <laughs> so I, uh, I feel like there's a lot of, a lot of room for improvement mm-hmm. uh, that I can still do. And I'm learning some of uh, some of the uh, ultra running uh, tricks and tools that you can use. But you know, I, I definitely like to you know like to work with people that uh, that apply really sound training principles to yeah. you know to uh, and it's it's a fine balance of you know of just like science and art approaching to coaching. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's great. Thank you. And and my apologies for uh, getting that part wrong there. Um, so let's transition oh, to no. <laughs> Western States 2017. Maybe you could tell us, you know, was it as brutal as everyone said it was? And um, if that is the case or if it isn't, you know, what was it that was so bad about this year that made it so difficult? Yeah, so I, you know, it feels like I, uh, you know, I, I only have one comparison, you know, I compare it to, yeah. you know, 2015, which was my first uh uh, 100 miler and I felt like that day in 2015 just everything just was uh, almost effortless you know effortless um, the weather was pretty good you know I was really well prepared for for uh, for the heat that day despite going off the course you know I felt like I was just floating on the trails uh, all day long in 2017 there were a lot of surprises mm-hmm. a lot of surprises and you know m- it, it was from the very, very beginning. You know, we um, we had to run, you know, over 10 miles on the snow. And at first, the snow was uh, a little bit deep, uh, which wasn't as bad. But then we got to really just kind of hard and icy snow. But mm-hmm. there was a lot of just, you know, uh, a lot of effort just to stay on two feet. Oh, yeah. And, you know, you're in a high country, you're at altitude, and you're doing a lot of just maneuvering uh, on the snow and using muscles that, don't usually use uh, mm-hmm. when you're just moving forward uh, on 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 nice trails. And after that, we moved away from snow to a bunch of mud, which was way above the ankles, almost like knee deep. Oh yeah, and that takes a lot of just like emotional energy out of Absolutely. you in the, in the first you know thirty miles of the race. So I think that was underestimated by by many of us like how much emotionally, not just physically, mm-hmm. that was going to take out of us. Mm-hmm. That was the beginning of the race <laughs> before we even got to the, you know, extreme heat, uh, which, you know, most years that that is the one element that everyone is trying to, you know, to fight. Mm-hmm. It seems, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It seems like that was the the thing that everyone was prepared for. But um, at the end of the day, it didn't really help as much as it should have because of the other elements. Is that kind of what you mean? Yeah, I think that it just added to, you know, to the heat uh, mm-hmm. so much more. And I think that despite knowing that the first 30 miles were going to be uh, so un- unforgiving, you know, and trying to do my best job to really back off and not leave too much, you know, of my leg strength uh, mm-hmm. on the, on that in that first 30 miles, uh, I believe that it took, you know, a little bit more out of me than, than I wanted. But that's part of Western states, you know, yeah. it's kind of the beauty of the challenge that, you know, it's always unpre- unpredictable. And there are, you know, again, there are elements that can change, you know, the, the temperature, you know, sometimes, you know, it can be over 100 degrees in the mm-hmm. canyons and, mm-hmm. and how much energy you spend, you know, in those canyons, you know, you don't want to, you know, hammer the, the, the downhills too hard. You don't want to give up give out uh, too much energy during, you know, during the heat uh, in those canyons, it's it's a fine balance you yeah. know, that you have to, that requires you to really listen to your body. Mm-hmm. Because once the sun goes down and, you know, you're running uh, into the evening and later on, you can use the leg speed to really keep moving. But if you really waste a lot of energy early in that race, you're not going to have that in, in your legs uh, at the end. Mm-hmm. And that is where you have an opportunity to move actually and run at a good clip. So do you think that's where a lot of the other runners made a few mistakes was that they underestimated it and kind of went a bit too hard too early and maybe just slightly unprepared and weren't 
expecting how bad it affected them? Yeah, I, I think it's it's a combination of just, you know, it's not just disrespecting it um, as much as just believing that you can do it, like mm. you can beat that. And I've learned over the years, you know, to make sure just that I listen to my body. You know, yeah. I, I think that if you look at, you know, the age of, of my competitors, they're definitely uh, younger than me. Mm-hmm. And I think I have an easier time just listening to my body. Yeah. And that's something that just comes with, with and having the confidence to back off, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. having the confidence to, to let go of your pack or having the confidence to, you know, to tell your pacer, like, you know, to, to push me enough, but also give me feedback that something is out of, you know, out of your control right now. And this is where you need to stay. It, it's not easy to do because everyone, you know, in that way, uh, especially you know, up front is really com- really competitive athletes and yeah. you know they want to just leave everything you know on the course mm-hmm. but where you leave it is the fine fine balance yeah definitely definitely sounds like it's the case and I hope someday I get to kind of understand what you mean by that but so was it really hard you know you did finish second in the race um so obviously worked your way up and we're kind of not that far behind Cat Bradley who won the race but was it really hard for you right. to kind of see so many of the other runners struggling so much or is it kind of a case that with ultra running you kind of expect that there's going to be casualties and so you kind of have to learn to not let it bother you too much oh yeah it's extremely hard because it's such an intimate community and you want everyone in that race that chose the line to have the best race of their life Mm -hmm. and you know there's one thing about you know not having good good race not having the race that you, you you hoped and still reaching that finish line. Mm -hmm. And there is the case where you don't reach the finish line. And I've been in both of them and many years Mm -hmm. Uh, and I've had plenty of, you know, where, you know, if if I had to like really say how many races in my running career were exactly what I hoped, I can probably just pinpoint to like few, right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But those are the races that, that keep us going. Now, we just yeah. need one race that was the perfect race to keep us going, despite having ten races that were not really what we hoped. But it's the it's the races that we don't reach the finish line that are probably the hardest. Yeah, and we see this so much in ultra running. I mean, both. You know, people don't reach the time goal, people don't reach the finish line, and it's extremely heartbreaking. Mm-hmm. Like. Uh, but I think that is part of what attracts us to this sport, that it is so challenging and that you have to fight all these different elements from, you know, nutrition doing. Uh, your stomach can stop you from finishing a race and put you on a sideline. It could be a blister that develops and suddenly, you know, it's there for 40 miles and it's unbearable to, you know, to put pressure on, on and, and weight on your foot. I mean, there could be little things that just stop your race. and. Yeah. People keep keep coming back over and over again, and that is the beauty of the sport. That you just you're surrounded by some really tough people mm-hmm. that keep trying over and over again, and it's an honor to you know to be part of this community. Yeah, and it seems like the ultra community is just wonderful, just so supportive, and just really like you said, close. So, do you see a difference as you you know have been a pro at both the marathon elite level and you know the ultra level? Do you see a difference in how the community comes together between the two sports or distances, maybe? You know, I, I, obviously the ultra running community is a lot smaller, so it is a lot easier to create that. Mm-hmm. And uh, I do feel, you know, this wonderful support, intimacy in the, in ultra running. But, you know, that being said, you can create that in, in road running as well mm-hmm. uh, and the track. I think it really... It takes certain people just to, you know, yeah. to create that. And I see a lot more of it these days than ever before. And, you know, you've got training groups, people are training together, people definitely support one another. Mm-hmm. And we need to continue to do that because we are better off as individuals and it takes us to the next level of, you know, of uh, excellence and success when we do it. So true. So true. Thank you. That's really interesting to hear. And and yeah, as I look at it, I definitely can see that in 
in uh, the road and track world as well. So one more thing I wanted to ask you was, you know, you do work for Goo. So maybe tell us a bit about what Mm -hmm. your job involves working for Goo, just for anyone who is interested. Yes. So uh, I have been involved uh, with Goo actually since uh, uh, year 2000. So actually when I first got into marathoning and uh, I started as a as a research uh, assistant in the R&D department, so research and development. And after many, many years at Goo, I'm now the vice president of, uh, of research and product development. And my job uh, is to create and optimize uh, current pro- uh, products, new products, and also collect all the research that is associated with the ingredients that we use in our uh, product, but also work with athletes uh, from any sport to optimize uh, their nutrition, mm-hmm. which is a lot of fun. You know, I get to really, truly do what I love every single day. Mm-hmm. And do you have a favorite goo product? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, it's, uh, I mean, I have, I have few. It mm-hmm. depends on, on what occasion. If you ask me right before a run, uh, right now, my favorite is uh, the ginger ale soup uh, I like to have that with oh, my yeah. coffee. And uh, my favorite uh, during product is the Summit Tea Rectine Drink. Okay. And I, it's, a, it's a drink that it's, it tastes like iced tea, and you can get all of the calories and branched amino acids, electrolytes, all just in one bottle. And that is kind of my go-to plan when I when I race. And uh, yeah, those are the two products that uh, you know I never leave for a race uh, without. Okay. All right. I will put links in the show notes to those two products and the link to the Goo website so you can learn a bit more. And um, I'm sure Magda has had a, a lot of uh, impact into what they have come up with and will come up with in the future. So it'll be interesting to see where you go next. So I just want to take a moment to thank our sponsor and then we will be back with the Running For Real 4. Catching up with friends on a run is one of the best feelings a runner can experience. The miles fly by, you feel good, and it just becomes so much easier to keep going. They push you to be better and you push them to be better. But for most of us, those runs are few and far between. So how do you stay motivated when it's just you and your thoughts? Wouldn't it be nice to have someone alongside you pushing you when you need it most? Well, running on your own can be tough to stay motivated, and I'm excited to introduce to you a new friend of mine, someone I know you're going to love, V. V is the coach in your ear, and she doesn't talk all stiff like a robot, but she talks like a real person. She'll give you advice, let you know how you're doing, and actually talk to you like a friend would, in an encouraging way, but still pushing you to do your best, not letting you off the hook when the going gets tough. But she also knows everything about you, so won't let you overtrain yourself either, which I know many of us are guilty of. You can find out more and enter to win your very own V at getv.com forward slash running for real. That's getvi.com forward slash running for real. All right, Magda, just four more questions for you, starting with a unique nutrition tip, something that you use or something that you've always believed in other than maybe goo. <laughs> Yes. Uh, so branched amino acids are essential amino acids that uh, we put in, in good products and most of our products. But those are essential uh, building proteins um, mm-hmm. that you absolutely need to get from your diet or from a supplement. And we put it in goo and they preserve your muscle mass. And there's a lot of damage that happens. Uh, during like ultra running, especially when you descend or you're out there for a long time. Mm -hmm. So preserving your muscles for years and years so you can stay in the sport, look for branch amino acids. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, What about a running for real moment? Maybe a moment you uh, were, the only runners would understand. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I have a tendency when I run in a group of people to kind of just elbow them all the time. For some (laughs) reason, I just gravitate to people. You're one I of those people. I into him and I, I'm <laughs> yeah. one of those people. Yes. <laughs> yeah. There's nothing wrong with that. I just, I know exactly. I've got a few friends who do that, but <laughs> yeah, that's definitely a, a running for real moment for sure. What about a high moment and why it meant so much to you? Uh, finishing my first hundred mile race was an incredible, incredible moment. Mm-hmm. And seeing my son uh, waiting, uh, staying up for 19 hours <laughs> and watching me and going from aid station to aid station and being there to finish with me, with me the last 300 on the track was just uh, 
such an incredible uh, moment for me. And I know it's, it has been a very significant moment for him. Mm -hmm. Definitely. I could see that absolutely being uh, a huge moment in your life. All right. And finally, what do you tell yourself when you're standing on the start line, getting ready to race? I tell my, I tell myself, um, you got this, you got this, you got this and live it up. It's something that, uh, my coach has always reminded me that no matter what, it's a celebration of all the work you have put in. Mm -hmm. And now it's time to just go and enjoy so racing has always been a reward for me versus something that I dread. I, yeah. I look forward to racing. It's a celebration of months and weeks of workload. And no matter what happens, I always try to have a good time. I love that. I love that. So important. Finally, I ask my guests to send me a photo to put in the show notes of you or or whoever it is, in what I call a power pose. So that's maybe what you would do to stand on the start line to build your confidence. Or maybe if you were nervous about something, how you would stand to really get that body language down so that you're feeling good about yourself. Will you send us a photo of yourself in your power pose? Absolutely. Okay. I will do that. Great. Thank you so much. And then what about if people want to follow you in the future? What's the best way to find you? You can find me on Instagram, Run Boulet, Twitter, Run Boulet. Those are the two best places. Okay, great. Well, Magda, thank you so much for your time. This has been a wonderful chat and I know the audience are just going to absolutely love it. So thank you for um, being with us today and for being an inspiration to so many. Thank you so much. Such an honor to be on your show. Isn't she such a sweetheart? I mean, so much good advice. You can just tell she's just one of those people who is so genuine and lovely that you just want to talk to them all day long. So I'm so glad that she kind of opened up to us and, and shared her insight with us because she's just such an inspiration and just a really great woman and obviously very successful and, and very determined to do uh, well in all the races that she enters. So you can find links to everything we talked about today in the show notes at tinamuir.com forward slash episode 16. That is about all for today. If you have been enjoying these podcast episodes or if you are a new listener, I should say welcome. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this podcast. I know you could be spending your way, your time many other ways and I really appreciate it. I hope you will consider subscribing to the podcast. If you need to know how to do that, you can go to the show notes for today or go to any of the show notes for the podcast and I will explain how to subscribe so that it goes directly to your phone every week as it comes live. So thank you so much for tuning in. Next week, we have Dr. David Gaia, who I think you are going to love. He has lots of great advice about injuries and, you know, just some, he's actually a physician who genuinely cares about runners and his favorite part of working with runners is seeing their faces as they get back to running, which is not something you hear too often. So check out that one next week and have a great week in advance. Thanks for listening to the Running For Real podcast. Be sure to check out tinamuir.com for show notes and even more helpful running information.